Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I want to wrap up the hemi block series. I want to talk about posterior hemi block, um, which is of course the left posterior hemi block as all hemi blocks are left. Let's jump right in. So let's talk some of the epidemiology first. Let's talk some of the statistics and then we'll go into the EKG findings. So it's rare to see an isolated left anterior hemi block. I'm going to show you how to find one. It's just rare to see it, okay? Uh, also, the left posterior fascicular block, that's just another name for it. You'll hear people call it that. Whichever nomenclature they decide to go by is totally fine with me. Just, just roll with it. They're talking about the same thing. So why is it rare to see an isolated one? It's because there's a dual blood supply. The right coronary artery, the left coronary artery, they both have elements that can perfuse this. So it's just rare to see an isolated one. And when you do, that is usually a long-standing coronary artery disease, whether it's plaque deposits or fibrosis or atherosclerosis, long-term uh, sympathomimetic abuse, cigarette smoking, whatever have you, um, it's usually tied in long-term uh, disease, but even then, exceedingly rare. Even in the case of the acute MI, it's barely over 1%. I think 1.1% is the last study I read. So 1.1% of the acute MIs, all the acute MIs out there, can produce a left anterior hemi block in isolation without anything else. So what do we usually see it paired with? What, right? It's like, it's like wine and cheese. Usually you get a left anterior hemi block with a right bundle branch block. Those are the two things you see that kind of go together in this. And uh, when you do, <clears throat> that mortality rate is going to be 71%. So over 7 out of 10 patients that you have do this are going to die despite your best efforts, despite the best efforts of the physician, et cetera. So this is kind of a big deal. Catching it early can make all the difference in patients who have this stage of coronary artery disease that results in, in this uh, detrimental of a finding. Detrimental is a good word for that. I'll, I'll stick with that. So what are the causes of this? Uh, coronary artery disease, that's your main culprit. So Long-standing coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, cigarette smoking, alcohol abuse, sympathomimetic abuse, um, unmanaged hypertension, all these things that bring on long-standing coronary artery disease are going to provide the, um, the causality for this kind of stuff. Less frequently but possible are arterial hypertension. So conditions which would cause uh, hypertension, we're not really talking about uh, coarctation of the aorta or anything like that here because that's usually found fairly early in life or the um, great clusters of aneurysms usually present themselves with a bleed or something long before the heart has time to wear out. The heart is a very resilient organ. So uh, in those diseases that manifest very early and are usually caught before four, five, six, seven years old, you're usually not going to see this kind of stuff. Um, usually, but you know, it's like Francis Schaeffer said, the only absolute allowed is the absolute insistence that there are no absolutes. So when you hear hoofbeats, consider it could be a zebra, just be looking for horses. We also see it in cardiomyopathies. Lots of reasons that people would have cardiomyopathies, whether they live at high elevation or it's a genetic predisposition or whatever have you. Um, so we can see it in other diseases as well. So Lennegray's disease or what's commonly called Lev's disease. You probably heard it mentioned that way in lecture. Uh, it's easier to say. People kind of shy away from that, that trisyllabic moniker. And I'm not 100% sure I'm pronouncing it right. But, you know, if you do some research on that, that is a, it's an idiopathic <clears throat> fibrosis of the heart. Uh, so you kind of see for no good reason, the heart kind of turned into this fibrous material that's not structurally functional. The blood supply is not really functional or even there. And uh, it just is sort of a degradation um, of the myocytes in general. So you can see it there as well. So EKG findings. So we've talked about why it's important. We've talked about where we see it. What do we see when we find it? Please bear in mind that what we're talking about right here is for a left posterior hemi block in isolation. In just a few slides, we're going to talk about the left posterior fascicular block in, uh, or with a concomitant right bundle branch block. So right axis deviation is usually gonna be greater than 90 degrees. So right axis deviation greater than 90 degrees. As soon as I see that, I begin trying to either rule this out or find it, right? I begin looking for it. Um, so you can have RS complexes and leads one in ABL, 
and and I've got some waveforms coming up on the next slide. I wouldn't give you guys a bunch of stuff without giving you some EKGs to follow it, right? What kind of cardiology channel would it be if that happened? So also there's a QR restoration. Um, it's normal or slightly prolonged. I want to talk about that really quickly. Uh, remember, this is in isolation. So with the right bundle branch block, we expect a wide QRS greater than 0.12. In the left posterior fascicular block in isolation, it's going to be like the left anterior hemi block, that 110 millisecond uh, QRS complex. Okay. Also, the small Q waves and tall R waves are what we call QR complexes in 2.3 and AVF. And there's some QRS, or excuse me, the prolonged R waves, uh, peak time in AVF. That's kind of a uh, kind of hit and miss sometimes. Usually all these things are found together, but that, that's not always there, I, I wouldn't say. Um, there's increased QRS voltage in the limb leads. Do be dubious of that finding because such a thing can be canceled out. Take the case of the COPD patient, right? It's very common to see low voltage QRS in uh, some of the leads with the COPD, particularly because of the air trapping and things of that nature. And then uh, there's usually not any other evidence for, uh, no evidence for any other cause of right axis deviation. And that's a big deal. You should be looking for the causes of right axis deviation. If you can find nothing and you find all these things, you're inching toward an isolated left uh, posterior fascicular block. That will be the unicorn of your career unless you go really deep into cardiology. It's not something you'll see all the time. And even, even if you were a cardiologist and at a giant hospital it still would not be something you see all the time um, however it's possible it could happen to you tomorrow so here are some waveforms and morphologies kind of broken down by lead if you want to pause the video here or sort of go back and forth with the last slide and just look at these and identify each one of them with the bullets um, that'll kind of help lock it into your memory not going to dwell on it too long and sort of rehash all the stuff i just told you i'm trying to keep these videos a little shorter these days so let's talk about what we see with the two together. So um, the right bundle branch and the left anterior hemi block together. Anterior, right? So this is kind of a shoot off of the last video, not the current one. Uh, you're going to have a QRS complex greater than 0.12 seconds. QRS complex is going to be positive. Remember your turn signal method. There will be left axis deviation and no other cause for left axis deviation. So no reason for you to think left axis deviation. So no left ventricular hypertrophy, no right ventricular MI, right? None of that stuff. Now, with the right bundle branch block and the left posterior hemi block, this is the 71% mortality. You notice everything is the same except there's right axis deviation and no other calls for right axis deviation. So you have no core pulmonale, you have no pulmonary embolus, right? No S1Q3, T3 core pulmonale on the uh, ECG. No super huge uh, CHF signs, no, no long standing advanced COPD. No reason to suspect right axis deviation due to right ventricular hypertrophy or an MI on the left side of the heart. So you have no reason to suspect that. We have a QRS greater than 0.12 seconds. Your QRS complex is positive, meaning there's a right Bundle branch block, <clears throat> and you had the other findings that we found, or some of the other findings that we found uh, with all of this going on. Now you're talking about a uh, more than likely right bundle branch block with a left posterior fascicular block at the same time. This is your 71% mortality. If you don't remember anything else from this entire presentation, please remember that when you have a right bundle branch block and you have right axis deviation, you have no cause to have right axis deviation, that you should suspect it and you should have your patient prepared accordingly. So what do you do? Obviously, there's no magic medication, but why do patients die? All patients die for the same reason. They go into cardiac arrest, okay? So how do we prevent and prepare for that? We have our antiarrhythmic drugs handy. We have defibrillation pads in place. We're running serial 12 leads. We have at least one large bore IV, uh, oxygen at the ready, uh, airway management materials at the ready. We are ready to take over this patient's bodily functions should they hit a point where they can no longer maintain them themselves. This is how we decrease mortality from such an ominous condition. If you take those steps, uh, if you can read your EKG well enough to know to take those steps, your patients fare better. And at the end of the day, that's the name of the game. That's why you're here. You're not getting any extra money to watch these videos. I'm certainly not getting any extra money to make them. We're just trying to make a difference. So all you really have to do is remember what to look for 
and then know how to be prepared for the worst. Fortunately, we prepare for the worst cardiac wise the same way every time. IV, O2, monitor, DFIT pads. And then we adjust fire as things come to us, right? And that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, post them in the comments. Um, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get new videos all the time. And again, I had somebody say something the other day about a free trial to Shade Tree Cardiology or something along those lines uh, in a comment section of the video. Um, I am selling nothing. I charge money for nothing. I sell no t-shirts, no videos, no DVDs, no nothing. This is all 100% free. So if you see somebody selling something in my name or trying to throw something out there, uh, I need to know about it. They're a fraud. The whole concept of this channel was so it would be free and convenient training to the people who wanted to make a difference. All right. Thanks for watching, guys.